Hello everyone. Welcome. Um, next two weeks uh, I will be doing uh, a little introduction to psychoacoustics. Um, I hope you find it fun. There is a bit of this in the exam, so pay attention. Um, so the best thing to start with is just briefly say something about how vast the field of psychoacoustics is. It is actually huge. Um, it is all about how we hear stuff and it is bound to tell you how the hearing is a really complex uh, faculty and how your intuition about what hearing does uh, is not really accurate. Okay, so I, I can start briefly with just you know, kind of the, the whole field of perception is a quite a complex one, and uh, maybe a good introductory remark is uh, to tell you something about vision, which you might know already, but not necessarily, uh, which is that you don't see pixels. Okay, so when you enter this room, or for example, when you look at this uh, title page, you don't actually see pixels. You immediately read out the word psychoacoustics, and that's the first thing that pops into your mind. Now, if you really want to view the pixels, you can do that. You can pay attention to the font and the grain of this thing and uh, all the rest, but when you first look at it, you don't really see the pixels, okay? So it is a very crucial thing in, in perception, in sensory perceptions, that you get the high level information first. So this is an evolutionary thing, because what actually happens is the very first thing you understand, you immediately get it, is whether something is threatening or not, okay? So if you enter the classroom here, and suddenly I'm a 12-foot monster eating people, uh, you will get a really immediate emotional response of fear and run straight out. Unless you really want to save someone or you feel a hero, you watch too many Hollywood movies and stuff like that. Um, so actually the, the deepest, the most immediate thing will be some kind of an emotional response in terms of whether something is a threat or not. And then come certain high-level perceptions in terms of, okay, that's that guy, we know him already, that's the same old classroom, nothing strange about it, no funny smells, um, or potentially funny smells. So the point being that what you perceive is not the detail of the data, so to speak. <coughs> You always perceive something which is of a higher level. So typically when you listen to a track as well, right, you hear the whole thing and then you can figure out, okay, how does the snare sound like, how does the kick snare sound like. Yeah? And that's why, for example, it is very useful when you're making your track to leave it for a few days or a week and then come back to it. Because you reset, your, your whole perception of this thing kind of resets itself. You probably notice this phenomenon, yeah, the, the kind of the next morning phenomenon as well. You make a track in the evening, and then next morning it sounds totally different. It doesn't really do what it did last night. Okay. So the message here is that perception is largely nonlinear. It is largely adaptive. <coughs> okay. So it adapts to what you're listening to. That's why what you get is you're mixing your track, and you're you know it's an energetic track, and you're pushing it. And, and half an hour later, an hour later, you feel I can push it a bit more. Two hours later, you feel I can push it even more. And then the next morning, you realize, whoa, this is totally saturated. It's actually unlistenable. Okay? So this also has to do with the fact that your hearing is a very, uh, very adaptive thing. Okay? So that's a kind of an introduction, just so you understand that, you know, in order to get there, to, in order to get to the understanding uh, how the hearing works, 
we actually have to begin at the, at the very low level, and this is what we're going to scratch the surface <coughs> of. But somehow you should see it as, as, a, as a chapter in science that really can explain certain things that you <laughs> encounter every day. Okay, so I'm going to discuss very low level things mostly uh, and won't get into the explanation of adaptive hearing uh, very much uh, because it really is a, a very, very extended bit of science and you could spend years, master levels, PhD levels studying it. Okay, so what you can expect in uh, the hour today and an hour next week is an introduction to these things. Uh, so what we're going to first look at, without too much detail, is the physiology of hearing, which means what are the organs, uh, the body parts that allow us to hear stuff. Uh, then we're going to get into estimating loudness, pitch and time. Okay? So, as I said, largely nonlinear phenomenon hearing, and you will see that there is essentially just a tons of curves that approximate how we hear these things. So we don't have anything like a linear measuring system built in. We have a largely adaptive and evolutionarily developed system. Okay? <coughs> and that has to do a lot with how it actually works. And believe it or not, there are gender differences as well. There's differences across species uh, in terms of, you probably know that dogs hear ultrasound frequencies, whale he whales hear uh, subsonic frequencies so it's it's an evolutionary thing and one of the things that's worth highlighting already is that it is a very complex system and part of the reason that it's so complex is because of its frequency selectivity okay so the point being that all the uh, myths about your body responding to fixed frequencies in different ways are just myths. Because uh, watery limp uh, kind of tissue that we are built of has a very broad band resonance. Okay? So if I find a frequency, what they call a brown frequency, makes me want to go to the toilet really immediately, uh, it is not a fixed frequency. It is a wide bandwidth of frequencies that can trigger my bowels if this sound is very loud. Okay? Similarly to all the other parts of my body, uh, at least on this macro scale, uh, they won't respond to fixed frequencies, they're wide bandwidth resonators. To create a really narrow bandwidth resonator, biology has had to do a lot of work. Okay? And that has everything to do with hearing. So uh, the point being that if my body responded to fixed frequencies, it wouldn't develop ears. Okay? Just so you know, because there's a lot of uh, funny pseudo facts going around about, you know, healing frequencies and stuff like this. Uh, so there is definitely a really, really deep scientific background uh, that is likely to bust all those myths. Uh, cool, so once we discuss those basic things, loudness, pitch, and time, we get into stream segregation. Uh, so the message here is that your ability to uh, hear my voice as coming from a single point in space, uh, hear all the components of my voice belonging together, and not be distracted, or indeed allow yourself to be distracted by someone who is whispering in your ear, has everything to do with stream segregation, which is extremely complex. Okay, so what appears to us, a kind of, oh yeah, well that works out of the box, obviously I hear you speaking, that is a lot of neurological processing right there. And the interesting thing is, you can kind of measure these things up by how well uh, machine learning performs. Uh, machine learning performs much better in recognizing faces than voices. Okay? So that tells you potentially something about it being much more complex. And if you look into the neurology of hearing, indeed there's many more processing layers than for vision. Okay? So it seems to be slightly more complex. Uh, okay, so that's stream segregation, how you actually isolate and group things together. 
Okay, because the fact is that there's a lot of different spectral components created by my speaking voice, so you're actually grouping them, so it's not just stream segregation, it's stream grouping as well. And that's a huge, complex uh, set of uh, facts and research findings, uh, which we won't go into in great detail. And then we're going to talk about localization, which is kind of related in that it allows us to group spectral components coming from a certain direction and it allows us to estimate the direction where the sound comes from. Again, a really complex neurological system that allows us to do this. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Gestalt principles have to do typically with how we can fool the hearing system, so how things get grouped and because of that how we can create uh, ambiguous stimuli, uh, stuff that you think you hear but never happened, or stuff that happens but you never heard. All of these things are possible. And I'm going to briefly, in the end, describe some of the methodologies for creating listening tests. We don't really have practicals connected to these lectures, uh, otherwise you would probably be making a few listening tests or at least trying a few out. But it's a good thing to uh, look at because obviously looking at your final year project some of you are potentially thinking uh, to create some listening tests so these methodologies can be quite interesting. So all in all it's quite dense, quite a lot of things and this is for both lectures. Uh, so <coughs> hopefully I'll come halfway today and otherwise I'll accelerate a bit uh, next week. Okay. So briefly about physiology, I won't go into great detail. Obviously, if you love to read maps and uh, kind of look at complex charts, remember names, it's all quite interesting. You can dig into these things. You can even find videos with microscopic cameras getting into the ear and actually seeing all these things. Obviously, I didn't go starting medi study medicine, so I expect you're not really keen on cutting ears up. But actually, a lot of the psychoacoustics, especially in the early days, was about cutting up ears of other mammals uh, or indeed of corpses. So, uh, you know, medicine has to rely on these techniques as well. And it is kind of related to medicine, obviously, the physiology of the ear. So, here is a sketch. Uh, you recognize this is an ear flap, auditory canal, and the eardrum. Okay? So, if you put a cotton bud into your ear, you can go almost all the way until the eardrum. Um, and then comes the middle ear and the inner ear, and in here you have a few interesting systems. First of all, you have the ossicles, which are three tiny bones that connect the eardrum to the cochlea. And what it is, it is an impedance matching uh, trick. Okay, so uh, the case is that until the eardrum, the vibrations are transmitted through air, so it is air pressure oscillations. Then these become mechanical oscillations, so these bones move, and then these oscillations, vibrations, are transferred into liquid. Okay? So the thing is, the reason why you can't really, you know, have liquid straight up there is because every uh, transmission to the next medium causes a lot of reflection. Yeah? So typically water surface reflects sound quite a bit. Every solid surface reflects sound. So in order to create a good transfer, you really need to do a lot of work or, you know, mammalian evolution has to go through hundreds of thousands of years in order for this to develop seemingly out of nothing. Okay, so that's an impedance matching thing through bones into the liquid, and then in this liquid, what you get in this uh, uh, spiral shape, you get the membrane which resonates based on the vibrations coming in, and this membrane, the cochlear membrane, actually uh, peaks in different positions depend on, depending on the incoming frequency. Okay, so we're going to talk about that uh, in slightly more detail when we talk about pitch perception. Uh, so it is a kind of a loose membrane, uh, 
it is actually uh, narrowing, it has multiple uh, channels of liquid, one on top, one in the bottom, one on the side. Obviously, if you're interested in the physiology of this, uh, it's, it can be quite exciting to read about it. There is some amazing lectures as well online about this. What we're going to focus on is stuff that we can use. Yeah? So, obviously, you're not becoming ear surgeons, so I won't go into great detail here. Uh, one interesting thing uh, to note is that these canals here, they're actually responsible for your sense of balance. That's why they, you have kind of three things sticking into three directions of space. Uh, so your ear is responsible, you know, for you not falling over when you do this. If you do yoga, then obviously you, you, you're developing these neurological systems quite a bit. Uh, and then another important thing, it's not on this graph, but what we have as well is the Eustachian tube somewhere, uh, which is uh, an air pressure equalizer. Okay, so you understand that sound is oscillation of air pressure. Uh, the audible sound are the oscillations which are faster than 20 hertz, right? So the air pressure has to uh, go up and down more than 20 times per second for you to hear it as sound, and less than 20 or probably 15,000 times per second as well. So uh, in saying that, uh, you potentially link this to the oscillation of barometric pressure, and with the rainy weather like now, the pressure is rather different compared to a sunny day. And those oscillations are much higher in amplitude. Okay? So the sound is a very small oscillation, but the weather-based pressure, air pressure oscillations, are much, much larger. And they don't destroy our ears, thanks to the Eustachian tube, right, which ends up in your throat. So you're kind of balancing the DC offset, right, the absolute pressure around your eardrum, and that's why, you know, and, and this Eustachian tube takes a while to, to do this equalization, okay, so that's why when you're landing with an airplane, you feel pressure in your ears, you feel pressure in your eardrum, because your, your Eustachian tube did not equalize the pressure, so what you do is you can massage here underneath your ear, you can open up your jaw, you can chew on something, and you can also do this, right? So I'm pushing air pressure into my throat from the lungs. I'm making sure it doesn't exit through my mouth or nose. So the air actually comes from here, you stack in tube, and pushes the eardrum out of it. Okay? Uh, I think that's all I wanted to share about this physiology thing. Again, a lot of interesting facts there. Uh, here's the list of these things. So I think I've... Uh, mentioned all these things. So one thing about the cochlear membrane that I will add in here um, is the presence of inner and outer hair cells. Okay, so what happens is in the cochlear membrane we have a frequency to location response. Okay, so if I run a, a, an oscillator uh, from low to high frequencies, okay, uh, then I will get a peak along this membrane moving, okay? And such that the high frequencies are close to the base and the base of the, of the membrane, not the base frequency, so the, 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 the starting point of the membrane, and the base frequencies are at the end of the membrane where it's more loose, okay? Um, and this is what we call tonotopical mapping. So tone to topic, to topic is uh, essentially a position. So it's tone to position mapping. This is what happens in the ear. And that's what allows you to <coughs> hear frequencies separately. That's the frequency sensitivity, the basis for it. Uh, so these uh, locations are picked up by inner hair cells. And the outer hair cells what they actually do, they're an active component of hearing. So one thing to understand about hearing that it is an active system. It has its own pre-amplification, so to speak, and it has its own way of becoming even more frequency selective. That's why you can train your frequency selectivity of the ear, and if you played an instrument without frets, 
like a violin early on, you can be really quite accurate in hearing very small differences in frequency. If you're not trained, it is much more difficult. You can train this ability. So the way this works is that the outer hair cells increase the, uh, the, the uh, how should I put it, they actually uh, dampen the response of the cochlear membrane just around the frequency that you're hearing. Okay, because you can imagine this being a physical um, kind of a tissue, so you don't really get a very sharp peak, you get a kind of a gradual peak, but then what happens is that the outer hair cells, they suppress this peak on both sides, making the peak narrower. Okay, so we have an active mechanism that makes us hear and uh, distinguish frequencies even better uh, like that and it actually also work, works for loudness okay so what happens if you go raving if if they push up the amp slowly it is gonna hurt your hearing less than if you go and experience an explosion because the outer hair cells will dampen the response of the cochlear membrane but it takes a little bit of time. So if you gradually increase the levels, your ears will slowly shut down, so to speak, or make things uh, softer. But if you're exposed to a level immediately, unexpectedly, it can actually damage your hearing more so. I believe you've had a lecture on hearing damage. I won't go much into those things. Okay, so active systems <coughs> both for frequency selectivity and for loudness. Now, the other thing that comes out of the cochlear membrane is not just the position, which maps the frequency, but also uh, what they call a temporal code. So you get spiking of the neural uh, fibers, and that spiking also helps frequency selectivity as well. Okay, so it is actually not quite clear yet. Uh, how exactly this works, but there's definitely a combination of the temporal code and the position-based code that allows us to hear, to have this amazing ability of hearing stuff rather clearly. Okay, so it is a really complex system. Uh, and one of the phenomena that uh, you find in this temporal code is phase locking. So th these, these spikes uh, coming from the uh, cochlear membrane will lock in phase. <coughs> okay? And this seems to be responsible for uh, our hearing of consonants. Okay? So if you understand the musical intervals that are consonants, if you look at the waveforms, you will find that they actually have a kind of a synchronicity between them. They tend to have one phase uh, of the waveform kind of in sync and then they go slightly out of sync and they go back in sync. So if you remember those graphs where you see all the harmonics, right? So the harmonics will typically lock uh, the, the firing, okay? So there is a sense of this phase locking mechanism uh, being responsible for consonants of intervals, why certain things seem to you know, play together well, harmoniously, they seem to fit together, and other pitch intervals seem to be rather disturbing, harsh, so on and so forth. Uh, interesting thing is, though, I've recently read something, there's a new study about uh, some isolated African tribes which do not have a specific neurological response to an octave. So there seems to be some evidence that the traditional understanding which says octave is the holy almighty thing uh, it, it is uh, neurologically really pleasant it has to be because of phase locking and all the rest uh, it seems that it is actually uh, quite strongly cultural as well okay uh, awesome so we talked about that the other thing that the outer hair cells allow you or uh, or actually are responsible for is the two-tone suppression so what happens is that, as I said, the, these outer hair cells will make the uh, position, the response in position, more accurate. 
So they're kind of damping the response just next to the main peak. And in doing that, they can suppress your perception of tone, which is accidentally just there. Okay? And this is another thing that you can measure with listening tests and so on and so forth. So it is a rather strongly nonlinear system, which has obviously developed for you to be very alert to sound. Okay? So one of the things possibly interesting to mention is uh, that the distance of the sound source is also very quickly available to your perception and it is actually the thing that will wake you up from your sleep which is an evolutionary fact obviously if something creeps up very close to you you're really alert to that so if you do an experiment whereby you have an equal loudness of something which is far away compared to something which is close by you get a much stronger neurological response from something that is close by okay so that goes back to what I started saying in terms of the high level uh, characteristics are immediately available to your perception you immediately know whether something is close or distant okay uh, without you having to listen out for it uh, and there is so much more I mean you immediately <coughs> know uh, whether your best friend uh, had a good night's sleep or not you know there is so much complexity in hearing it is just immense and that's why I'm saying you know probably an undergrad degree on psychoacoustics is something uh, you know easy to design there's plenty there and then if you really want to push this uh, field then you really need to spend many more years in order to come up with something that has not been done yet yeah, because it's obviously scientific relates to medicine relates to a lot of experiments and all the rest okay uh, funny fact if they numb your outer hair cells, uh, you hear stuff 46 dB less, 46 dB less, that just stuns. Yeah? So the amplification, the preamp, so to speak, due to outer hair cells is this much, that's huge. The microphone preamps don't go that high, typically. Okay, so once that is through the cochlear membrane, all of the complexity there, then we have the auditory nerve that goes into certain brain regions, and that's where a lot of complex things start happening. The interesting thing is that not only is the cochlear membrane frequency selective, it is also the auditory nerves. So you can actually measure the frequency response of different bits in the auditory nerve, and they have different frequency response. So actually you get this narrowing of uh, the, the, the selectivity increases as the signals progress through the nerve. So yeah, I mean, all in all, a huge amount of interesting, exciting stuff. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about peripheral, peripheral processing uh, from the perspective of creating models of it, because it allows us to understand what is the main thing that is, uh, that's happening there. Uh, there is a term which is uh, uh, peripheral uh, channeling, uh, which I didn't put on this slide, but if anyone is interested in exploring uh, what kind of processes take place in terms of uh, hearing audio in the periphery rather than in the brain, that's the term to look up. Uh, compared to stream segregation, which I've mentioned already, which is kind of more brain-based processing. So, all in all, a huge amount of processing. And, by the way, it is not all sorted out yet. Okay, so there is there is tons to do here for surgeons and for kind of people wanting to test hearing and discover new things. And then, obviously, you know, it all connects to music. You know, how, how we hear stuff uh, in daily lives, how it all works in application. Okay, so I'm going to do this quite quickly I believe uh, so what we have is essentially a bunch of filters okay that's that's how we uh, emulate the peripheral hearing uh, outer and middle ears are both uh, simulated by a filter and then inner ear is modeled by a set of filters okay so that's a filter bank these are kind of two filters in series and then comes the filter bank now this filter bank 
uh, is rather complex. Every little filter in there, so to speak, has a slightly different response, nothing like linear. Uh, there is different ways to approximate this. The simplest uh, ancient thing is the herb, herb scale, which is equivalent rectangular bandwidth. So they kind of measure these responses in the basilar membrane, and then they say, well, the nearest thing in terms of a rectangular bandwidth is this. And then they can draw a graph from that, which we will look at in a bit. Uh, so as I said, these filters have everything to do with being uh, spatial positions along the membrane. Uh, and then on top of uh, the frequency selectivity, the actual bandwidth of the filter changes as well. Okay, so uh, what we have is that filter bandwidth is larger for high frequency filters. Okay, uh, so if you think about it, well, actually, it kind of makes sense because you, we are very selective for pitch and the pitch goes up to 2K, maybe 3K, and then from 2, 3K up to 15K, there's quite a lot left, okay? So we are not very selective at those frequencies, uh, which means that these filters are actually wider bandwidth. They're not as selective. And then the other fact, which is potentially even more interesting from the application point of view, is that the bandwidth increases with loudness. So if you hear a loud tone, you are less frequency selective, okay? So that's the reason why, why you make a lovely sounding mix in, in a studio and you take it to the club and it's just too much, it's too saturated, there's too many things going on, it is too dense. It has to do with the fact that that's how your hearing works, yeah? So if you want to make a club mix, yeah, it really has to sound rather spiky and kind of expanded in the studio, kind of popping in and out, very dynamic, and then you play it in the club, and then you have a sensation of fullness. Because if it sounds full in the studio at the regular listening level, you pump it up in the club, it is too much. Okay? So one way to get there is to, you know, mix at those levels initially, or at least, you know, ask, ask a club owner to let you in during the day to check your mixes, and then after a while you will learn how these things map and you will be able to create a club mix in the studio because it's not trivial. It's not trivial at all. Okay, so the way we hear largely depends on the loudness that we hear. We're going to look at that in a second. Okay? So here we are, loudness perception. What it is that we can say about loudness perception? Well, first of all, it is a subjective thing, okay? We don't have a measurement device, uh, and our sense of loudness depends on so many things. I would say that the most crucial thing, which is potentially counterintuitive, is that it depends on timbre, okay? So typically, what happens is that your sense of loudness has everything to do with your sense of the intensity of the excitation. Okay? So if I, you know, if I have a whispering voice and I have a screaming voice and I play these two at a same energy level, so technically measured loudness, so to speak, the power, uh, then you will have a different perception in terms of how loud these things are. I mean, if I really ask you to analytically pay attention whether one is louder than the other, uh, it will be a different thing compared to me asking you which one is louder. Because if I ask you which one is louder, you know that the screaming voice is louder, no matter the fact that I've played it back softer. Okay? So the, the connection of timbre and loudness is so crucial. And this is one of the mechanisms that allows you to appreciate an acoustic instrument from a digital instrument or otherwise electronic instrument. Okay? So what happens with an acoustic instrument that the timbre, which has a lot to do with the intensity of playing, is very tightly connected to the actual loudness, how loud something is. Okay? 
So th that's a matter of fact. If I knock on this table softly, you get a certain timbre. If I knock loudly, you get a different timbre. It's not just the volume knob, knob going up. Okay? And we are very sensitive to this, and you immediately recognize it. Okay, that was the same table. If I mess this up, if I create a slightly different timbre, mess up the actual volume of these things, you will notice, wait a minute, something is wrong with the knock. You won't necessarily know what's wrong, but you will immediately pick it up. Okay? So that's why it is really an art form to create a decent electronic instrument, because, I mean, to the extent that you want it to sound natural and not electronic, per se, because that's a different aesthetic, right? We kind of appreciate the fact that the kick drum is always of the same level and, and it, it gives us a totally different sensation in terms of the aesthetic, in terms of the quality of the sound source. Uh, but if you want to create a natural sounding electronic instrument, it really is a challenge. And the other challenge is to mix natural instruments and electronic instruments. Because typically for an electronic instrument, you control the loudness with the volume knob and it does not change the timbre and that's where it falls apart okay so if you're trying to match uh, an acoustic instrument with an electronic instrument there is only a very tight tolerance uh, that gives you the sensation that these sources in inhibit the same space right because otherwise it's like okay well they kind of play together, but there is some, there is some uh, distance, there is some unnaturalness, they don't really combine. You probably notice this, okay? And it has everything to do with this connection of timbre and loudness. So how would you fix this? How would you make it so that the timbre changes with loudness for an electronic instrument? What would be a very simple way of doing this? Well, you can just put a filter on top, okay? So what happens typically is that a more intense excitation will excite more harmonic content. So typically high frequencies uh, become louder as the intensity of excitation uh, increases, okay? So what you can do as a matter of practice, I mean, I'm quite... Uh, surprised that it's, it's not part of our daily tools anyway, a kind of a loudness knob, which actually has a very gentle filter on top, and when you push things, it actually opens the high frequencies up a bit more. Okay? And that's the other clue uh, to trying to match your electronic sound sources and acoustic sound sources. Play with the amount of high frequencies. Okay? Because they definitely tell you something about the intensity of excitation okay and then matching those things because you see if I have a really loud electronic sound but it doesn't sound like it's intensely excited and I have a very intensely excited acoustical sound source but I can't really push it further up into the limiter I end up with a mix which is just not working okay so play with these things that's that's the message here because, you know, the, the, only, the only way to really figure out whether it does the thing is by listening to it carefully. Okay, so let's get into some uh, detail about loudness perception. So it is definitely subjective, definitely very complex, definitely connected to timbre, definitely connected to bandwidth. Okay, so if you know, uh, if you own or maybe your parents had an old school hi-fi amplifier, uh, with the loudness knob. Anyone knows what the loudness knob does on an old school hi-fi amplifier? It actually filters the signal. It gives you a good old smiley EQ curve. It boosts the highs and the lows. So technically what it does, it increases the bandwidth. And the increase of bandwidth gives you a sensation of a louder sound. Okay? The reason why this is the case is because this sound with a larger bandwidth suddenly excites more inner hair cells along the basilar membrane. Okay? So what happens is that your sense of loudness is not a measurement, 
it is a very complex combined sense and part of it has to do with how many inner hair cells are excited. So if only a narrow bandwidth sound is present, it excites only a small amount of inner hair cells, and as the bandwidth grows, it excites more cells, and there you go, you have a sensation of a louder sound. Okay? Crucial. Okay, so bandwidth also relates to the loudness, the way we hear it. Okay, so... Uh, one of the things that was measured in psychoacoustics uh, ubiquitously uh, is the just noticeable difference, J and V, and we have just noticeable difference for uh, loudness and we have it for frequency as well. Uh, typically it is roughly about 1 dB. So if you have a 1 dB uh, level difference, you can notice it. If it's less, you're unlikely to notice it. So that's, these just noticeable differences have everything to do with measuring, okay, what is the least amount of variation that you can uh, figure out, and actually you have just noticeable difference in terms of the position, typically expressed in angles. So you know, how, how much does a sound source need to move for you to figure out that it is at a different location, and as you might expect, there is a certain threshold. Uh, there is a certain accuracy that we can achieve and anything below that is just left unnoticed. Uh, so we have, in terms of measuring loudness, one thing that you've encountered already is the SPL, the sound pressure level expressed in decibels, and typically 0 dB is the average level of a just noticeable tone at 1 kilohertz. So the way we uh, look at loudness is uh, we look at what is the least, the softest sound that we can hear. And what we have is that this threshold depends on the frequency of that sound. We're going to look at that in a second. In terms of figuring out what is the minimum audible pressure, we have two measurements. One is this MAP, which uh, is about a single ear and we have the minimum audible field, which is actually a more natural situation where you have both ears available, and they're slightly different as well. So if you go into the details, you know, the amount of psychoacoustic curves out there is just huge. Uh, there's really interesting stuff. Another thing that loudness depends on, believe it or not, is the duration of the sound. So what you can actually say, it depends on everything you can imagine probably even on the amount of light in the room. We are largely synesthetic uh, beings. Yeah, it probably depends on the amount of coffee you've had. You know, it's just immense the amount of stuff that influences your perception in many ways. Uh, the only thing that is totally dampening your perception, any clues? The one thing that, that really makes us think it's all the same, day by day, in and out, is your thinking processes, okay? So that's typically what happens for a human being. The thinking occupies the mind so intensely, because we have a culture that tells us that it's the most important thing around, keep thinking, you'll figure out things, you'll be getting things, uh, that it actually dampens all the sensory perception, okay? So if you want to get into any sort of accuracy in terms of perceiving stuff, being alert, hearing the sound with great accuracy, you really need to work on your thinking processes and learning how to uh, make them a bit more silent because they overpower everything. So meditation is great and much better than other uh, substances that allow you to kind of, you know, mute the thinking part of your brain. Uh, so yeah, depending on duration, something that is shorter than 0.2 seconds in duration will seem louder. There you go. It is a measurable thing. So all these things that I'm claiming are obviously not, uh, not arbitrary claims. They have all been measured. Okay, so it's, it's a vast, vast scientific field that we're scratching the surface of. So I'm going to accelerate a bit uh, in the last few minutes. Here are the equal loudness contours, okay? The so-called Fletcher-Munson curves, 1933. So you see it's probably been about 100 years that people are intensely measuring uh, the hearing system. 
obviously with analytical signals, sine waves, noises, and stuff like this. And this is one of the earliest findings, uh, which tells you what is the sound pressure level of the sounds that you hear as equally loud. So one contour shows you the equal loudness. This is the equal loudness contour. And here is the threshold of hearing, the lowest. And what you see then is that at 20 hertz, you need at least 75 dB to hear the sound, whereas you can already hear even below 0 dB at whatever that is, about 3, 4K. Okay, so that's 70 dB difference. That's huge. Okay? So that's your equal loudness. So when you think that the bass is as loud as the hi-hat, well, that's a perception. It has nothing to do with the amount of energy that that signal actually contains. And what you see as well is that as you get a louder signal overall, these curves are slightly flatter. Okay, so for a, for a hardly audible sound, it is a huge difference between bass and high frequencies. And for a really loud one, well, we are down to whatever, 30 dB there from 70 dB difference. Okay, so that's quite crucial to understand that it's largely nonlinear. And I mentioned things about SPL. Uh, Evidently, two sounds of the same pressure level are unlikely to be perceived as equally loud based on all these things I've said. Uh, those values that you've just looked at are actually sone curves. So that's a unit of measurement for perceptual loudness. And then, obviously, you've seen it was in 1933, and since then we have slightly uh, better unit, which is... Uh, sorry, uh, sones is that unit, phones is the ancient one, I've made a slip there. So, and with the sones, they've actually made it such that they add up better. I mean, they say that, you know, if you double the loudness in sones, it is actually corresponding to you hearing something twice as loud. For me personally, that doesn't really make any sense. What do you mean twice as loud? It, it doesn't really, you know, it's not size, it's not physical. You can't really measure the perception in that way, as far as I'm concerned. Obviously, you can say, well, I'm going to have two things of the same loudness placed next to each other, and then they're twice as loud. But to me, it doesn't make much sense. Nevertheless, a lot of uh, thinking has gone into that as well. Uh, and then the important thing is that those shapes that you've just seen, if you invert those shapes, what you actually get is typically your A weighting curve for measuring the loudness disturbance, right? Because if you're less sensitive for the bass frequencies, okay, it means that when you want to assess the disturbance from a club next door, you have to compensate for that, okay? So you probably learned about these curves already, and they have everything to do with inverting the equal loudness contours and making sure that you compensate for the things. So briefly about loudness and bandwidth, this has everything to do with the critical band. So that's a concept I will briefly introduce and hopefully next week spend a bit more time on it. What happens is that as bandwidth increases, at a certain point stuff starts happening. And this happens in many domains. Uh, we won't even be able to go there. One of the things that happens is that the sense of loudness increases. Okay. So imagine a signal which increases in bandwidth, but the energy of the signal is constant. What happens is that I hear it as equally loud, and then suddenly I hear it as becoming louder. So that's your relationship of bandwidth to loudness. If you have a wider bandwidth sound, you perceive it as louder, and it's measurable. Okay? So here are the facts about that measure. Uh, and the other thing that also happens due to these critical bands is masking. Okay, so you might have heard of this one. What happens if you have a loud sound, you won't hear the soft sound, typically if it is higher in frequency and not much higher in frequency. 
Okay, so it has to do with uh, basilar membrane limitations, too much excursion, and then the thing gets lost. You have the two-tone suppression, which is kind of related to that as well. Uh, and the funny thing is that this also works in time, so you have time masking. You can actually hide stuff in time, in frequency, and you can hide it in space as well. So left to right masking works as well. And here are your typical loudness masking curves. Okay, so what this shows is that if I have an excitation, what is this, let's say 400 hertz, probably read somewhere, uh, and it is at 80 dB, everything under this curve will stay inaudible. Okay, so you can actually produce, you know, I can play something in this area here at, you know, what is this, uh, 40 dB less, and you won't hear anything. I switch off the masker, the sound, and suddenly you're like, okay, now I hear something. Okay? So that masking is quite an interesting phenomenon. And these critical bands are also responsible for how we hear frequency. So we'll get into frequency perception next week, start with that. But I'll leave you with this graph, which tells you what is the actual equal spacing in frequency as far as the perception goes. So what you have here, the straight lines, are musical intervals. Uh, I believe this is, does it say somewhere? This is a third, a major third, and I think this is a fifth. Okay? So what you get is that the critical bandwidth uh, is, did I say it the other way around? So the typical, the, the critical bandwidth is typically about a third octave in the middle of our hearing range. Okay? So that's why suddenly the major third becomes very consonant. Okay? Because suddenly it triggers the hair cells next to it. They don't fight in exciting the basilar membrane. Okay? Well, uh, I hope you enjoy that. Uh, Quite, a, quite an intense scratching the surface, and we'll continue next week. If there's any questions, I am happy to tackle those. All right, well, thanks for coming, and I'll see you next week.